uh, let me share with you another uh, challenging problem that was managed by endoscopic resection. Uh, this patient underwent colonoscopy and was found to have this large polyp in the cecum across from the ileocecal valve. Uh, multiple biopsies were taken and uh, attempts to resection were unsuccessful. A tattoo was placed close to the site and was subsequently referred for, endosc for surgical resection. Uh, the patient decided to pursue endoscopic resection and came to see us. And I find this, as you can see, I went to the cecum and then I pulled the scope back because the polyp was on the right side, which is uh, a very difficult position to resect. And by reducing the scope and pulling back to the transverse colon and then trying to push back to see if I could uh, reposition the polyp in a much more favorable condition, i.e. in the left or lower quadrants of the operating field. Unfortunately, uh, despite this maneuver, I found myself that the polyp was still in the right half of the field, but at least moved to the center of the field. So we decided to inject the polyp. My initial impression of this polyp was that this is uh, a benign polyp. It, is, uh, it has a granular component. There was no flat component except for the area that was biopsied. And uh, it is crossing over a fold. So you can see on the front side, that is the, and over and on the back side of the fold. Uh, whenever you see a polyp like this, uh, it is important to figure out how you're going to inject and resect. It is all about having a good game plan. So in this case, we decided to inject saline uh, with a little bit of uh, methylene blue uh, without uh, epinephrine. So I kept my uh, colon decompressed and I moved uh, to the appendiceal side of the polyp and decided to inject there instead of on the front side. By injecting here, it will give me an opportunity to push the polyp towards me instead of back into the cecum. Once it goes back into the cecum, it becomes very difficult to uh, resect. So this is a, an important first step that you should uh, take and uh, make your injection help you uh, reposition the polyp to a much more favorable condition. So then I tried to inject over the fold, but because of tethering of the polyp, it did not lift. So I decided to inject on the front side, on the anal side of the polyp. So here we're injecting saline with a little bit of methylene blue and without epinephrine. And, and as you can see here, there is a very good lift. So after the first two injections, I reevaluated the position of the polyp and felt that it may require another injection at the lower half uh, so as to lift the entire polyp away from the underlying muscle and vessels in the deep submucosa. So whenever you have a polyp that is not easy to access, it is important to inject uh, quite a bit of fluid uh, so that if in case your resection becomes technically challenging, you have a much larger amount of saline submucosal cushion and hopefully that would limit the amount of deep thermal injury and the risk of perforation, something to keep in mind. The second one is uh, you also have to keep in mind what type of scenario you use in a difficult uh, position. Uh, preferably best to use a 
a 10 millimeter snare, but in this case, I felt that the front portion of the polyp I could access easily. And, uh, and instead of picking a larger snare, 20, I felt that 15 millimeter stiff snare would work. And uh, we decided to use Endercut Q uh, 3, 1, uh, 4 setting uh, because of risk of uh, having multiple large feeding vessels whenever you encounter a larger uh, polyp with a lot of meat, as you can see here in this case. So once I uh, tighten the snare, I uh, take the snare into my hand from the assistant's hand and try to slowly uh, cut the polyp. And once I cut the polyp, the first step I do is look at the base to assess the depth of resection. If you see nice blue submucosa, uh, you should feel good about it because the resection is limited to the submucosa and there is no muscular injury. Regarding the resection of the polyp over the fold and on the appendiceal side of the fold, I felt that if I put in a lot of air, I would not be able to uh, ensnare the polyp as the cecum expands. So I used uh, what is called underwater resection in this case. Uh, underwater EMR uh, was described by uh, Dr. Ken Ben Miller from uh, California. Uh, and uh, this is a, a beautiful technique. Uh, although I don't use it routinely for all my cases, I try to use it whenever I find that I may not be able to access it well, especially in, a, in the cecum uh, and especially when I have a very difficult scope position. So here again, uh, I decided to take the snare handle into my hand and use a slow cut uh, to cut this uh, polyp. So following this resection, I could see that my resection base was again limited to the submucosa. Uh, there was no bleeding and there was a, a little more polyp uh, left and I wanted to see whether I can resect it. My approach to this polyp was a little bit uh, challenging, as you could see. Uh, it is parallel to the wall. That is the difficulty when you're resecting polyps on the right side of the field. In that case, you may want to uh, get your injection needle and inject uh, some more to change the plane of access to the polyp. And uh, this is something to keep in mind. When you're not able to access it easily, uh, go back to the injection and inject some more so that you have much better access. So here, um, after the injection, still using water submersion, underwater EMR, 15 millimeter snare, we are able to get the lower three-fourths of the polyp along the left edge or the polyp along the appendiceal side uh, of the main polyp. And uh, as you close the snare, you want to keep uh, infusing water so that you allow the polyp to float into the snare and then close. You also have to keep in mind uh, how uh, the plane of the snare closes. So in this case, we did not resect the entire left edge because the top half comes down as an, at, a, at an angle and the lower half is at a different plane. So it's important to read the planes of the sequel wa wall in order to resect. So the left uh, lower edge was completely cut, but uh, there was a little bit of uh, polyp tissue left at the upper end. And uh, for this, we used a smaller snare, uh, shifted to 10 millimeter stiff snare, and uh, anchor it along the uh, resection edge with a little bit of normal tissue, and then push the snare to the wall 
and then slowly close. It's all about keeping your snare parallel to the wall of the resection for a safe resection. If your snare uh, gets at an angle and, and uh, entraps muscle, that's when you may end up with a deeper resection or even perforation. So there was a little bit of bleeding. Uh, I tried to use uh, soft coagulation uh, to control this bleeding. Uh, with the snare tip. Uh, this was described by Michael Burke's group from Australia and uh, for some reason it did not work and whenever that happens you always can use your hemostatic forceps, uh, soft coagulation effect 4. Uh, you can use anywhere between 60 to 80 watts uh, to control the bleeding. So with soft coagulation, we are able to control the bleeding. And then you examine the resection base. And uh, I see that there is a little bit of uh, whitish tissue uh, stuck there. This is underneath the biopsies that were taken from previous procedure. Usually when you take multiple deep biopsies, they tend to cause scarring. And uh, I wanted to clean it up using hot biopsy avulsion technique. Uh, the endocut settings are endocut I111, effect 1, duration 1, and interval 1. Uh, although my examination of the resection base and resection edge revealed no macroscopically obvious tissue, I decided to ablate the edge as part of uh, my protocol. Uh, this includes uh, a setting of uh, a forced APC, 0.8 liters flow, uh, 35 watts, and I try to burn until the edge turns brown, not white, but brown. So I started that, uh, at the top end, either left or right, and slowly work my way down uh, to ablate the entire edge of the resection. As you can see here, we completed the left side and then and then we go after resecting after ablating this, we go to the top end and uh, complete the APC. So we start uh, it's always easier to uh, do the APC starting at the top end, and as you rotate your scope, either right or left, in this case, I'm rotating my scope to the right and then slowly pulling back uh, to have a nice ablation. I, I want uh, uh, especially trainees to learn the technique of ablation in a controlled manner. And this will help them learn how to do marginal cut down the road if they want to get into ESD or hybrid ESD. Because of the large resection and my own concern about whether I could completely close the defect or not, I decided to uh, cauterize the, some other vessels that I've seen on the base. Uh, it's interesting that uh, some other studies have shown that um, it may not add benefit, but what I've seen uh, from uh, some of the expert Japanese endoscopists, they routinely uh, cauterize the vessels because they believe that it does cut down the risk of delayed bleeding. So we use uh, hemostatic forceps, soft coagulation uh, to achieve the ablation. So that whenever I see a large defect, uh, I want to share a few tips on how I close. I basically take my cap off, biopsy port cap off and decompress the colon so that the wound becomes uh, smaller. And uh, in this case, I used a 16 millimeter clip. Uh, uh, we are uh, in the process of evaluating this uh, uh, 16 millimeter clip. This is a short clip. Uh, and uh, we, I realized that I may not be able to get uh, uh, mucosa to mucosa in the largest portion. But in that case, what I do is I try to at least get uh, one edge 
and try to get as much of the submucose as possible to make the defect smaller. In large defects, such as these, when I put the first clip, I do not put the second clip very close to that. I will leave a little bit of distance uh, so that these two big clips tend to make the wound smaller. And then I can place uh, other clips in between those two uh, by approximating one edge of the mucosa to the next edge of the mucosa. So as you can see here, this is what we are demonstrating. This is a large defect uh, that was uh, be, that is being closed with the use of clips, as you can see here, after the first two clips, and then keeping the wound uh, decompressed, uh, keeping the wound small by decompressing the colon, not necessarily by just suction, but by opening up the cap. Uh, or pulling the cap from your biopsy port so that the air vents out. And that actually has uh, helped me close uh, uh, quite large defects that I thought I may not be able to close. And uh, the other important point to keep in mind is to learn how the colon collapses and use the natural way the colon closes and, you, and follow that path uh, to close the defect uh, with uh, clips. So here, uh, as you can see here, I'm placing the clip in between the first two clips that were placed to make the wound smaller. Another point to keep in mind uh, and is, uh, especially in patients who are uh, obese with the protuberant abdomen, uh, for large uh, polyp resections, especially in the right colon, uh, I've noticed that with uh, regular propofol deep sedation, as the procedure goes, they may have uh, issues with their breathing. That makes it very hard to do a very fine uh, job. Uh, hence, um, uh, I use general anesthesia. Uh, including the use of uh, paralytics with the help of my anesthesia colleagues at the different stages in the, in, in the procedure. Uh, that gives me a much more stable position. Uh, if I'm able to do this job, I just wanted to share with you how appreciative I am uh, uh, for all the help my anesthesia colleagues provide in taking care of these patients. So. We were able to close the defect and uh, recently closure of uh, defects has been shown to cut down the risk of delayed bleeding. Uh, I'm very happy to see that work from uh, uh, Heiko Pohl uh, and his colleagues uh, from Dartmouth. And uh, I've been closing the defects uh, for nearly 10 years. Uh, because I felt that if you close it right and create a deep uh, submucosal approximation, you're likely to uh, get hold of those vessels and cut down the risk of bleeding. And uh, finally, it's important to retrieve all the specimens. In this case, we used a net, uh, a roth net, uh, to uh, remove uh, the polyps.